All right, shalom, everybody. Peace and blessings. Greetings in the name of the Most High and His Son, Yahweh Shai. Bring the beat down just a touch for me. <clears throat> it is Sunday evening. I'm grateful for everyone who is joining us here in the service. I'm glad that you were all here and everyone that is also joining us online. We are almost at the end of the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 21. We are going to get all the way to verse 1. Just kidding. We, we're going to get at least to verse 5. Let's start off with verse 1. Let's dive right in. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. The word says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. What happened to the first heaven and the first earth? They passed away. And, and what is it that John is seeing now? Okay, now I want to show you how the scriptures explain to you what time it is. Because this is at a specific time. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 is telling you about a time. That time is the end of the Old Covenant. The end of the Old Covenant? Yeah, let me show you what I mean. Give me Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Now, we cover this scripture all the time, but most people are not aware that there is a clock built into this scripture. It tells you when the old covenant ends. It also tells you when the new covenant begins. The scripture says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, again, watch the next verse. He says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Isn't that what time it is? Where in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, he said, the old heaven and the old earth passed away. Now Jesus is telling you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Where was that law written at? That was written on tables of stone. Okay, now those tables of stone, they endure, and that covenant endures. Even if you don't have those tables of stone, because what happened to them? They were broken. Those things are dust. They decayeth, and they're ready to vanish away, is what the scripture says. But they don't get to go away just because the world wants them to go away. There is a specific time when the written word will no longer be written on the outside of you. Where's it going to be written at now? On the inside of you, on your heart and on your mind. Now watch this. Let's just run through this again now that you guys see when this is taking place. Because he tells you, till heaven and earth pass. Well, that's going to happen in Revelation. That happens 1,000 years after. 1,000 years after Christ returns. 1,000 years? What will we be doing in the, in the kingdom? Keeping the law and the commandments. We will be resting. Give me the next verse. Watch what it says. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in where? The kingdom of God? Nope. In the kingdom of heaven. Now, most people in most churches don't have the knowledge that there is more than one kingdom. We are at the place in the scriptures in Revelation where we are going to see both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Now he says they shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. How long does the kingdom of heaven last for? What? Wait. Think about what I'm asking you. Everybody's just, man, y'all had a little, see that's why I didn't have any of the sweets. Think about what I'm, how long does the kingdom of heaven last for? 1,000 years. It only lasts for 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is not forever, is it? Okay, now these people who are breaking the commandments, they are called the least in the kingdom of heaven. It says, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great. Where? In the kingdom of heaven. How long does the kingdom of heaven last for? 1,000 years. What happens when the 1,000 years are up? Satan gets out of his, his bottomless, he gets out of the bottomless pit. And it ain't heaven no more. You know why? Because lies and deception happen again. 
all abominations come back on the earth. But then the Most High rains down fire on him from heaven, and that's the end of that. Now, what happens after the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of God. Okay, so what we are reading about now in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, the last two chapters are specifically describing to you the kingdom of God, which is distinctly different than the kingdom of heaven. They're not the same size. They don't have the same occupants. They don't have the same occupants. Who reigns in the kingdom of heaven? Christ reigns in the kingdom of who reigns in the kingdom of God? The Father does. That's why it's called the kingdom of God. We're going to take a look at all of those things in the scriptures. You may have never seen them before, but most people thought they was going to heaven and it's right next to Jupiter. <laughs> you going to outer space? You ain't even got no space suit. Watch this. Give me Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Isaiah 65, 17. We're going to take a look at this new heavens and new earth because the new heaven and the new earth don't come until the thousand years are over. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. How's that possible? That's crazy. You won't even remember. So let me explain. You guys, how many heavens are there? There's three. There's three. There's the one where the Most High sits. That's the third heaven. There is the firmament, which is technically the second heaven. It's an invisible so-called glass barrier that prevents us from leaving the earth and it prevents the waters the Mayim from pouring from the heaven down onto the earth. And then there's the heaven where the birds fly. Okay, you guys remember a while ago in Revelation, he said the heavens were opened. So that means that the second heaven was completely removed. And now there's literally just this heaven and it stretches all the way to that heaven. If you remove the middle barrier, the three heavens can become one heaven just by taking out one piece. All right, so he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Give me uh, verse 18. He says, But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people a joy. What is he creating? He's creating a new Jerusalem. Okay, watch this. Keep, keep going. Give me the next verse. He says, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Where's he going to be at? He's going to be in Jerusalem with us. Is this the kingdom of heaven? No, this is the kingdom of God. And I will be in Jerusalem and joy in my people. What's joy? See, that's amazing, isn't it? It's going to be real joy because he's really going to be there. Okay, now watch. He will joy in his people and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her nor the voice of crying. When he comes down, it's going to be impossible for you to cry anymore. It's going to be impossible for you to weep. You know what you are at that time? You are saved. People think they're saved right now today. You're not saved. You didn't get saved from COVID. You got it three times. You're not saved from the war that's happening over there. Even in the thousand years you still weren't saved because that's not the end. The scripture says, he that shall endure for how long? It doesn't say a thousand years. It says, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, what happens right at the end of the thousand years? People come rising up out of the graves. Are they saved? They A thousand years has passed by and they're still not saved. Now, how ridiculous does it sound for these people to be running around here today talking about, I'm saved. You, you are over a thousand years away from being saved. You're not even scratching the surface of salvation. Watch this. Give me Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith Yahweh, so shall your seed and your name remain. See, the new heavens and the new earth, how long do they last for? Forever. How long do we last for? Forever. Our name, our name now lasts 
forever. Huh, that's amazing. Give me 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Because he's got to create these new heavens, and we have to be ready for it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens, what's going to happen to the heavens that we have now? They're going to pass away with the great noise. And the elements, that means everything in the earth, shall melt with fervent heat. How's that happening? Fire is raining down from the sky. It's burning everything up. It's burning up the whole earth. Why are we not burnt up? We can't burn. We can't die anymore. We're, we're resurrected already. We've been alive for a thousand years with Christ. At the end of the thousand years, the, the Gentiles come up out, the, Satan comes up out of the bottomless pit, he rounds up all the rest of the Gentiles, and they try to make war with us. Does it hurt? It don't hurt. We can't die. How you going to beat me and I can't die, right? Don't you know the battle is already over? But they still try to do it, and he rains fire, boom, and he burns the whole earth. Do we want to live on this earth anymore after it's burnt and full of blood? Nah, this earth is done with so he says, I'm going to have to make a new one. I might as well make a new sky with it. I'm not going to make a new sea. We don't need a sea, do we? What was in the sea? Do you guys remember? Last Sunday night, we found out that the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, right? We don't want that sea. That sea has been full of death. Let's get rid of that whole sea. So now we just have the heavens and the earth. Now watch, it says, but the day of the Lord will come. As a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt. Is that even a real word? Burnt? I don't know. Watch, give me the next verse. I don't even know if that's a real word. Burnt. Put a T on it. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If you know that everything in this world is about to be burnt up, you ought to only be speaking the scriptures. People are like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, I'm doing pretty good. I'm halfway through Revelation. <laughs> Every single possible conversation has some type of scripture or reference into it because you know that the earth is about to be burnt up. Give me the next verse. looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Next verse, 13. He says, Nevertheless, we, who? We, according to his promise, look for, what are we looking for? Oh, man, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness see when the bible says the meek what are they going to inherit the meek shall inherit the earth not this earth the meek are inheriting a whole new earth okay give me one more verse verse 14 in there watch this wherefore beloved that's you seeing that ye look for such things be diligent that ye may be found of him look what it says in peace without spot or blemish why do you need to be found without spot or blemish say it again because christ is coming back he is the bridegroom and you are the bride when he comes back you need to be without spot or blemish okay watch this give me matthew chapter 24 verse 35 matthew 24 35 Look what Jesus says about his word. He says, heaven and earth, what's going to happen to him? Shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The Bible has been telling us all from the beginning to the end that the heaven and the earth has got to go away. He's like, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you blessing and cursing, life and death, all that good stuff. Okay. Give me Isaiah chapter 57 verse 20 i want to show you something about when he's talking about the sea we know that the dead were in the sea and the the, the the sea gave up the dead that were in them were those dead people good people now they rose in the second resurrection what were they wicked 
take a look at what the scripture says. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. Why is it not resting? See, this is getting a little bit metaphorical now, right? That's amazing. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. <laughs> That's crazy right there. Because how long are we resting for? A thousand years. The wicked, they don't get to rest for a thousand years. It says, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Okay. Take me back. Revelation chapter 21. That was all in verse 1. Let's take a look at verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We know where those are now. And the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Okay, that means that the law, the written law, the old covenant, is gone. It's not written in stone anymore. It's written in our hearts and in our minds. And there was no more sea. What does that mean? There's no more wicked. There's no more wicked people. We saw them and Satan get thrown into the lake of fire. Who else got thrown in the lake of fire? The beast and the false prophet. Who else got thrown in? That's, that's pretty good. Um, death and hell got thrown into the lake of fire. Give me verse 2. Watch what it says. And I, John, saw the holy city. What's the holy city called? New Jerusalem. You thought I was going to say New Jersey, huh? New, Jer New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, so this new city is actually, uh, it's called Jerusalem, but it's not the Jerusalem that the Gentiles are treading down. It's a whole new one because they've defiled it. We're not, we don't want that one. We want a whole brand new one. Now, this is what's weird. You guys are going to, you guys... In the back of my mind, I hear this scripture playing, and it says, there is no new thing under the sun. Keep that in your mind, because he said he's making a new heaven and a new earth, and now we got a new Jerusalem, and you're like, but I thought there was no new thing. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem. Give me Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. You won't find anything in Revelation that you don't find in some other place in the Bible. Watch this. The righteous perisheth. What happened to them? They burnt up. And no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Give me the next verse. <clears throat> he shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds each one walking in his uprightness now verse 3 take a look at this but draw near hither ye sons of the sorceress does that that doesn't say what i needed to say watch this hold on let me find this preset real quick i think i jumped one scripture Bear with me. Come on, that's amazing. Here we go. Isaiah 52, verse 1. That's the one I want. Isaiah 52, 1. Awake! Awake! Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. Why am I putting on beautiful garments? I'm getting ready for a wedding. O Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? The holy city. We just read that in Revelation. It says, for henceforth, that means from now on, there shall no more come in to thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. I know people think that you don't have to be circumcised anymore because circumcision is a part of the old covenant. Do you think you can be in the kingdom of heaven and not be circumcised when he said everyone who does breaks this commandment and is uncircumcised is, is cut off from among their people? That's crazy. Watch, give me verse 2. He says, shake thyself from the dust. 
Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. Why do I have a band on my neck? Because my enemies, they put a yoke of iron upon my neck. And I may have been a slave and I may have died. And like thousands of years have passed by and I woke up and I, I woke up, but I still thought I was a slave. It says, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Give me the verse three. For thus saith Yahweh, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now, the scripture says we sold ourselves to do evil. We were owned by the Most High, and we sold ourselves to the other nations so that we could do what the other nations do. When he says that we shall be redeemed without money, finally, we are redeemed. Finally, a man is going to come and he's going to buy us. The only man that could buy us out of our slavery is Christ. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68, real quick. Deuteronomy 28, 68. I want to, I want to show you why it says that we are going to be redeemed. The Bible says, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. That's referring to the promised land. At the time that we were moved into slavery and we came here on ships, we have, a, as a people, have not gone back to the land of Israel. Right? It says, And there ye shall be sold to your enemies for bondmen, and bondwomen, we sold ourselves for nothing. And it says, and no man shall buy you. That means no man will redeem you from these curses. No one is going to take you from the captivity that you're in until Christ comes. Because it was prophesied that he would gather us from all nations. So the scripture says, watch, take me back to Revelation chapter 21 and give me verse 2 again. John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down if it's coming down then where is it located at it's located in heaven it's coming down from god out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband give me galatians chapter 4 verse 26 galatians chapter 4 verse 26 is going to tell you we had been slaves on the earth but in this new jerusalem we are free galatians chapter 4 verse 26 the Bible says but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all see the Jerusalem that comes down the new Jerusalem that's our mother you you, you guys know who people think our mother is now nature she ain't my mother <laughs> Jerusalem is my mother and it's free and it comes down from above nature ain't married to Yahweh Shai. Jerusalem is. Does that make sense? Okay, watch this. Give me Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Hebrews 12, 18. It's going to get a little bit deep here because we got to get into some of this covenant talk. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. What mountain was that? Huh? You guys remember in Exodus chapter 19, Moses said, three days, y'all better get ready. The Lord is coming down. He's coming down on top of a mountain. Don't nobody get to touch the mountain. Any animal that comes up this mountain needs to get thrust through with a dart. Nothing can touch it. He says, oh, we're not. We're not coming unto the mountain that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. So we're not coming to that mountain. Give me verse 19. Let's find out what mountain we're going to. It says, and the sound of a trumpet. Remember, he blew the trumpet long in Exodus. And the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. You guys remember this story? Okay, he says, we're not going to that mountain. Our mountain is not going to look like that. Jump down to verse 22. It says, it's not going to look like that. Why is it not going to not going to look like that? Because that's the old heaven, old earth. If there's a new heaven and a new earth, then we're not going to that mountain. He says, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
and to an innumerable company of angels. Give me the next verse, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Jesus says, you know what we are because we rise in the first resurrection? We are also the firstborn. Yeah. Watch. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just men, watch this, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. What were these men made? They were made perfect. They were made perfect when they rose from the grave. That's when Jesus was made perfect, when he rose from the grave. A lot of people don't understand what it means to be reborn. They think Jesus was reborn when he was baptized. He was reborn when he rose from the grave because he rose in perfection and could no longer die. Okay, so we're not perfect yet. We're not perfect until we rise from the grave with a whole brand new body. What is this body right here? This is flesh. Can flesh get into the kingdom? Nah, I need to be spirit. So I have to take this old body and have it translated the same way that this Bible was translated. Give me the next verse, verse 24. It says, we're not come to that. We're come to Mount Zion. We're come to Jesus, the mediator of the what? Wait a minute. He's the mediator of the new covenant. How are you going to be under a new covenant and the mediator ain't even came back to make the deal yet? And to Jesus, we will be coming to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Okay? Watch this. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. We need to see this. I need you guys to understand. We are still under the original covenant. We are still made of flesh and blood. The, the law was written in stone. It is not yet written in our hearts. We still have to teach men to fear the God most high. The Bible says, oh, give me that. Um, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. This is what happens in the wilderness before the thousand years. It says, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. Okay, that sounds kind of scary. Um, give me verse. <laughs> give me the next verse. It says, and I will bring you out from the people. Who are the people? The Gentiles, the other nations. And will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered. With what? With a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. Give me the next verse. 35. And I will bring you into Israel. You don't get to go into Israel. You get to go into the wilderness. When the, when the people of Israel were in bondage for 430 years in Egypt, did they leave from Egypt and go into the promised land? Nope. Where'd they go? Into the wilderness. Why? I guess remember there was, a, there was a saying, there was a scripture that was circulating in my mind. And I was like, we're going to come back to that. What was it? There is no new thing under the sun. Why would we get beamed from here to Jupiter to live in heaven? That would be brand new. That's not what he did before. He rescued his people and they had to walk. They walked up out of there. We're going to have to walk too. He says, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face. Face to face means we're going to see him, right? Jump down to verse 37. Let's see what, after he's pleaded with us, he says, and I will cause you to pass under the rod. What is the rod? The rod of correction. Because there's still going to be a whole lot of false doctrines up to that point. There will always be a false doctrine until Christ himself comes back. Because what we know, do we know 100% of it? The Bible says for what, what we know, we know in part. We only know a part of it. And if any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So when Christ comes back, we will know even as we are known. So we're going to know perfectly. Look what he's going to do. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and will bring you into the bond of the covenant. That's the new covenant. That's when it happens. It doesn't happen when you're already in the land of Israel. You have to agree to this agreement so that you can go into the land. Does that make sense? All right, watch this. Give me Isaiah 54, verse 5. 
What did Jerusalem look like when it came down out of heaven? It was adorned. How was it adorned? Like a, like a bride. Jerusalem looked like a bride. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. Who's your husband? Yeah, Christ is. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Isaiah 61 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. What is that? That's my wedding garment, ain't it? Yeah. Okay, watch. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. What does that mean? She's completely covered in righteousness. She does not have a spot. She doesn't have a blemish. She's just standing there waiting, looking at the clock, saying he'll be here any time now. I'm waiting for him to return. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. This concept that we are already married to Christ goes throughout the entire Bible. It's also the reason why the Bible calls us a harlot. Because we're already married to him, but we, we over here going to the movies with Buddha and we we circulating and mingling with all these other fake gods the Bible says husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it give me verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word now here's the verse I need you to see verse 27 that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the bride that comes down. Christ did all of this stuff because he's already married to us. He had to clean us up. What did he use to clean us up? He used the washing of water, but by how? By the word. Okay, so he washed us by the word so that we could be clean when he comes back so that we could be presented to him without spot or blemish. Back to Revelation 21. Let's take a look at verse 2 one more time now that we understand it. <clears throat> and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That makes perfect sense now, doesn't it? Give me the next verse, verse 3. We're only going to verse 5 tonight. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. What kingdom is this again? This is the kingdom of God. Where does the Most High God dwell in the kingdom of God? On earth with men. What is a tabernacle? It's his dwelling place. Remember what's inside the tabernacle? There's a table for some bread, and there's a candlestick, probably like that one right there. And then um, there's a seat. What's it called? Mercy seat. It's on top of the Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark of the Covenant? The law and the testimony. And where does he sit? That's his throne. He sits on top of the law and the testimony, giving us mercy. Wow. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Does this sound familiar? And God himself shall be with them and be their God. There ain't no covenant that's coming after this one. And if you didn't obey his voice, then you ain't in this covenant because this is the words of the covenant. But see, now it's ratified. Because not only is Christ dwelling on the earth, he's been on earth for a thousand years now. Now the Father, at the end of the thousand years, himself has come to dwell on the earth. Y'all heard that, right? That was creepy. That was creepy. Let's keep going. Watch this. Give me Leviticus chapter 26, verse 7. He told us all the way back in the book of Leviticus that he was planning to come and live on the earth with us. Leviticus 26, verse 7. Seven. He says, 
Give me verse 3 real quick. I want to start at verse 3. I want to show you what this is referring to. It says, if ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. He says, that's the condition, right? Now jump to verse 7. And ye shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Jump to verse 9. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you. And what will he do? And establish my covenant with you. This is in Leviticus. They were probably like, what are you talking about? We already have the covenant. See, they didn't know that a new covenant was coming. Can you imagine? Like Moses has already come down. He's got these big old tablets. He already broke them. Man, see what you made me do? And now he's got to climb back up the mountain and get some new ones. And he's like, these things are crazy heavy. Let's put them on the inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And now they're on the inside of the Ark of the Covenant. He's like, ooh, that's good because I can't carry them things no more. Okay. They already have the covenant. But he says right here um, that he's going to establish our, his covenant with us. They had to be like, they probably missed it. You know how you don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. They probably thought he was talking about the old covenant. He's not talking about the old covenant, is he? He's saying, I know that you broke my covenant, but thousands of years from now, I'm going to have to make a new covenant with you. Watch this. Give me verse 11. When you get time, go back and read this Leviticus 26. The whole thing is about the kingdom of God. He says, and I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. He told you right there, at some point, I'm going to come and live on the earth with you. Verse 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. He told us that all the way back in Leviticus. We don't get to see the whole thing play out in its entirety until a thousand years after the resurrection. That's a prophecy for real right there. Give me Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 4. Okay. Let's see. I don't want to. I don't want to. No, give me that. Give me that verse. I want to show you something. Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 4, the Bible says, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. Who is the glory of the Lord? Jesus is the glory of the Lord. Give me the next verse. <clears throat> so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. That's called Shekinah, Shekinah glory. Give me the next verse. Where is Ezekiel at? And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. And the man stood by me. It's not a man. It's an angel. Give me the next verse. Mm. And he said unto me, son of man, the place of my throne. What is Ezekiel looking at? Ezekiel was moved in the spirit through space and time so that he could see the new Jerusalem. And the voice, the, the spirit of the Lord, the Shekinah glory comes in and it fills the whole house. But he doesn't see no images, but he hears a voice. And the voice says, son of man, come take a look. You got to see this. The place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom. How is it whoredom? They're married unto him, but they're with somebody else. Watch this, it says, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. So Ezekiel saw the same thing that John the Revelator saw. Remember how I tell you all the prophets, they see the same thing. John saw New Jerusalem. Ezekiel is here standing in the New Jerusalem. And the Most High is telling him, yeah, that's where my seat's going to be right there. And my feet are going to be over here. And all of this is mine. 1 Corinthians chapter 24, verse 20. Now, <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven lasts for a thousand years. And then Christ has to deliver the kingdom over to the Father at the end of the thousand years. 
That's an amazing thing that 99% of the people in Christianity have not seen. This is a very debated concept. When I tell people about this, they think I'm crazy. And I think they never read the Bible. Okay, now I'm going to show you so you can see it for yourself because the Bible is very clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 24, verse 20. It's going to tell you what happens during the thousand-year reign. And when the thousand-year reign is over, what happens? You guys with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 24. No, that can't be chapter 24, can it? Chapter, mm, hold on, it feels like 15. Let me find it, right? 24, where you get that from? Boom, let me see. Nah, it's not that. Hold on real quick. I was like, why is she not pulling the scripture up? <clears throat> Excuse me. Where's it? 1 Corinthians, hold on, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, I want to see verse 20, I was getting ahead of myself, did I, is that, oh, that's how I did, dyslexia, yeah, I don't have that, watch this, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So he's the first one that's rising from the dead to live forever. Give me the next verse. For since by man came death, how did death come into the world? By man, Adam brought death in. How did he do that? He was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Okay, so watch. For since by man death came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. What was the man that died and resurrected? That was Christ. Did he die as God? Absolutely not. Can God die? No. So what was Christ when he died? He was a man. When he rose from the grave, now he's God. Okay, watch this. Let's keep going. <clears throat> For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Everybody. Everybody's going to arrive. Everyone's going to be made alive in Christ. Give me the next verse. Stay focused with me. But every man in his own order. <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. You mean that Uncle So-and-so, he doesn't get to jump ahead of the line and go to heaven without me? Nah. He doesn't get to go to heaven without you. He's, he's there in the grave. He's dead. He's not in heaven. Because the Bible says, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. When do they rise? When he comes. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> 24. Yep. Then cometh the end. See that comma right there? Let's just pause. All the verses that we've talked about should come to your mind. You're like, then cometh the end. But he that endureth, how long? To the end, what happens to him? Shall be saved. What does it say on the screen? Then cometh the end. Now he's going to define for you what the end looks like. Then cometh the end when he, who's the he, who have we been talking about, Christ shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even to the Father. When I deliver something to you, do I still retain possession of it? Okay, so if Christ is delivering, but this is the interesting thing, this is part of the mystery, see, Christ is in God and God is in Christ the same way that I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. You guys see that words? Okay, so watch this. He's going to deliver the kingdom up to God. He was like, who's God? Even the Father. When? When he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. That's the end. Who's the last enemy? Who's the last enemy? Who is it? Death is the last enemy. Let's keep reading. The Bible tells you when this is going to happen. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. When did he put death under his feet? In Revelation chapter 20. Okay, so now we find out that the end doesn't take place until after Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 21, that's where we are now. Give me verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Let's keep going. 
For he hath put all things, no, nope, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Now, that doesn't mean accept, like please accept my apology. That's an accept, like an exception is being made. The Father is not being put under the feet of Christ. You see that? For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. An exception is made, which did put all things under him. So does the Father go under Christ at this point? No, he will always be the Most High. That's why we call him the Most High. Now look at verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. What happened in those verses? That's at the end of the thousand years. The last enemy that got defeated was death. That's when the fire rained down and death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. Is there anybody left to fight? Jesus has been king over the earth for a thousand years. What does he do? He gives the kingdom over to his father. Right? You guys clearly see that now, right? There's a lot of people who don't even understand that there's two kingdoms. They think we're just going over there by Jupiter. That's where we're going to live in our space. Give me 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. What is that? That is the covenant. When is this taking place? After the great white throne judgment. Okay, let's go back to Revelation. Let's take a look at that verse 3 again. Make sure we understand it. Say again. So that's taking place spiritually right now. It's going to take place physically at the end of the thousand years. Spiritually, God is in you and you are in God, right? The kingdom of God is located where right now? Within you, what is it made of? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, okay? If you don't have those things now, while you're living, breathing, and you still can die, you are going to die. You're not going to get them when you die. You need to have them now so that you will resurrect. Okay, watch this. So. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Wow, that goes all the way back to Leviticus. And he will dwell with them. We just read that. And they shall be his people and God himself. When it says God himself, that's the father himself shall be with them and be their father. That's what that means. Okay. Verse four. I think I got way deeper than I was planning to get up in here. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Why, why is there no more death? It's already in the lake of fire. Okay. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Man, I, do I even need to get into that one? Let me see. What line do I want to break down? I don't want to hold you guys too long. Let me see. What did you say? Wiping away the tears, watch this. Give me Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto the prophets. Now, if he's going to wipe away our tears and we're no longer going to cry, he probably said that somewhere before, right? Isaiah 25, verse 8, the Bible says, He will swallow up death in victory. <laughs> That's amazing that Revelation would say that and Isaiah would say that. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. His word is faithful and true. If it is written, it is going to happen. And there's nothing anybody can do about that. Give me Revelation chapter 7 verse 17. Revelation 7. Verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them 
and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is crazy because sometimes we're reading the scriptures and we're not even aware that it's talking about both the Father and the Son in one verse. Isn't it? Who's the Lamb? Is that the Father? Now that's only the Son. But in this verse, who's God? The Father. Because he's the one that wipes away the tears from their eyes. This happens often in scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5.17. There's this thing circulating in the back of my mind. It says, um, I told you guys to remember it. What was it? There's no new thing under the sun. So when do you actually become new? Because if you look up in the sky, you're going to see a sun. That means you're not new yet. That's not the new that he's referring to. Let's take a look at the scriptures. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Wait, when did you become new? When you were translated. You got a new body. You got a new mind. You got a new heart. There ain't nothing else new that can happen. Is the sun still around at that time? What, what does the Bible say about the sun in the kingdom? Is there a sun in the sky? Jesus is the light. Okay, so all this new stuff happens when there's no more sun. See, the word of God cannot be broken at all. It must all line up. So every time that the Bible talks about something new, you need to realize that's happening after everything else happens. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. What passed away? The heaven and the earth and everything that was old. All things are become new. That's what, see how this scripture fits into the timeline of what the God is doing? Let's go back, Revelation. Give me verse 4 again. Let's, I know I skipped a little bit of it because it's getting a little late. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. We saw that. And there shall be no more death. We know death went in the lake of fire. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Give me verse 5. Look. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. This is that scripture that's, that I was telling you that we were going to come back to. It says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no <clears throat> and there is no new thing where? Under the sun. At this time in the, in the scriptures, are we still under the sun? We are no longer under the sun with, with what we're reading. The sun has gone away. Let me show you. Revelation chapter 21. That's the chapter we're in now. Jump down to verse 23 so you can see. All these new things are happening because... God is on the earth with us. The Bible says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God, which one is that? The Father. For the glory of God, the Father did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. That's both of them in the same verse again. Do you see it now? Give me chapter 22, verse 5. Revelation 22, verse 5. This is my last verse. Maybe. Maybe. I got to take you guys all the way to the end. There's a place where it tells you that the whole thing is done. It says, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, <clears throat> neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. This is the kingdom of God. It lasts forever and ever. Okay, my very last verse. We just got to cover this last piece. Take me back to Revelation 21, verse 6. I'm not even going to pull a precept on it. I want you to see what time it is in the scriptures. And he said unto me, it is done. Is there anything left to do? It is done. There's nothing left to do. What does that mean? All things have been fulfilled, which are written in the prophets and in the law. He says, 
And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now we'll get into the precepts for this verse, Lord willing, in our next week service. That's the message that I have for you tonight.